a Liverpool and England legend, Steve McMahon. Steve, how are you? Mickey, I'm good, mate. Yeah, nice to see you, Paul. Are you keeping safe in this uh, these these terrible times? I've never kept safe in my life, you know that. <laughs> well, listen, you know, I, I don't really want to mention it. What about Liverpool and the league? We're, we're obviously hoping that football restarts soon, but you more than most will obviously want the uh, the season to resume when it's safe to do so, yeah? Absolutely. I mean, we keep talking about football and obviously we have to put when it's safe, fit and well-being of people is, is paramount. Yes. We don't have, that goes without saying. You know, so people are, are saying, oh, well, you're not worried about the, so, uh, the safety and well-being. Rubbish. That's the most important thing, yeah. first and foremost. But Liverpool winning the league is the second most important thing. <laughs> yeah. And it looks as though it's being curtailed and God knows what's going to happen. It's, it's a minefield. But uh, let's hope the powers that be make the right decisions. Whatever it, it is, it is, you know, you have to accept it. But me, my preference, and I've said I've gone on record as saying, uh, the season, if can be completed, should be completed. Yeah, on, on the pitch, yeah, definitely. On the pitch, um, as soon as possible. Uh, and whatever decisions they make, obviously we have to buy it by it. But I think it'd be wrong if they, if they just give Liverpool the championship, although it's all done and dusted. Uh, but you know, we, let's let's get it right. Relegation is probably important as well, and, and that's the crux of the matter. And finance is dictates in this day and age. Yeah, definitely, Steve. I, I agree with you. Uh, listen, I don't really want to talk about your old football career. It's embarrassing, really. I was just a journeyman, uh, odd carrier for the likes of Letizia and Shearer. You were a top quality player, and when I look at you, what you actually achieved and what you won, it's uh, quite astounding, really. Three league titles, two FA Cups, and four charity shields in your, in your time as a footballer. Um, but what I didn't realise was you started your career at Everton. I did, Mickey, yeah, yeah. I actually played 100 games for Everton, which is no mean feat as a youngster. Um, people obviously associate me with, with Liverpool, but my career started at Everton, 100 games, and I was actually captain as well, a young captain for Everton. Yeah. So um, it was difficult for me making that move. I had to because um, I wanted to improve myself. And Everton were a good side, but not a, not a great side at, at the time. But we had some great players. I've got to say that. Uh, but I needed to move for me for my career and, and to, to, to move forward. Uh, I don't regret it. Obviously, uh, I went to Villa first, and then obviously from Villa to uh, Liverpool. Um, and Kenny Dalglish's but, first signing, Steve. Yeah. Pardon? Kenny Dalglish's first time yeah. when he became manager. That's correct, yeah. I think it was, a, it was a big secret at the time, but he was planning ahead. He wasn't manager at the time. He wasn't announced. And he was getting all these ducks in a row. And I got a call out the blue with a like to join Liverpool. And obviously, it, it, it came to a head where he was announced as, a, as the Liverpool uh, player manager. And he, he, uh, he came for me and the rest is history, I suppose. So, whose place did you effectively take then? Who, who was the uh, the legend before you? Do you wanted it? Sunas, they never replaced Sunas, and and I could have joined Liverpool straight from Everton because um, Sunas went to Sampdoria, and they wanted me to replace Sunas. Then I didn't go. I, I chose to go to Villa for, for uh, family reasons, not not straight across the park to Liverpool. But when I got the opportunity again. Because they hadn't quite replaced Graham. Yeah. Um, they tried it in different ways. Um, but then once the call came from Kenny, it was obvious that and I wore the number 11 shirt as well, which Siri wore. So I think I was almost a direct replacement for Siri. Big big shoes to fill, mate. And uh, it needed a, somebody with a strong mentality and, and natural ability like yourself to do so. And I'm just thinking about uh, how the game's changed, Steve. Uh, and I, I don't know whether you agree or not. I mean, you, you were classed as a hard man. And I, were, I, I played with uh, Jimmy Case, who you, who, another Liverpool legend, and, and Terry Erlock, who were, who were hard men. Now, is that part of a game that's gone now, if you're a modern-day footballer? Um, you know, I've never, I've never put myself down as a hard man. I'll leave that to other people to judge on that. 
um, I, I tried to let my appearances and the stats add up uh, that I scored 50 goals for Liverpool. So you don't score 50 goals for Liverpool and you don't play in, in the World Cup finals uh, and you don't win the trophies you win just by being tough and, and hard. I mean, yeah. I don't want to be put into that bracket of a Vinnie Jones, if, if that makes any sense. I'd rather be put in a bracket that I could actually play football and, and yeah, I could mix it a little bit when need be. Uh, but I, I like to think I was a, an all-rounder as a, as a footballer. And, yeah, I'm probably doing you a disservice there when I say that because I'm just thinking. No, of, you're not. Mick. No, you're not. I think it, it's. I think it, the perception is that you're right. Yeah. Um, but when you look at that and you look at the history and you look at the games and, and 600 games played and yeah, it, it, you know you don't just get by 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 just being that. That's all I'm saying. That, you know the perception is that yes, I, I went out there and all I did was kick people around. <laughs> um, I did that sometimes. <laughs> not all yeah. the time. I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, we see, we see a lot of uh, players that go on to play for big clubs and I'm, I'm just thinking, of, and I speak to the young players about the mentality of, of football. You, you've got to have a strong will and a strong mentality to play for big clubs and win trophies like you did at, at Liverpool. Um, you know, because we see a lot of players go from uh, lower league sorry, not lower level Premier League clubs into the big clubs and they don't succeed for whatever reason. And that's possibly because, is there an expectancy on them to perform and they can't deal with it mentally? Uh, it's a, it, you have to have the whole package. And I, I again, I mean, for youngsters uh, that you deal with, especially uh, Brookhouse, it's, it's important to get the message across that you can have all the talent in the world and not make it. Talent alone does, won't, won't make it. You're better being average of talent and having the best of all, all your dedication, motivation, practice, and, 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 and being 100%. You know, you could be the best player in the world, but without the other attributes, then you're not going to make it. Potential for me, Mickey, is, is overrated. People, yeah. have, people say to youngsters, oh, he's got potential. We've got to stick with the potential, potential. Potential, you've got to fulfill your potential. First of all, most to a youngster, if anyone's listening, the youngsters are listening to me. It's a crime if you don't fulfill your potential. You've committed a crime um, because there's better players than you, than you and me um, that haven't made it. And, and there's average players in this day and age who have made it through hard work, dedication, and not being great players, but, but have made it, made a living out of doing that. So you have to work hard and, and don't look back and say, well, only if and blaming people. I think Ravel Morrison is a perfect example. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's just came up now that he had so much potential at Manchester United and he's finding his way again. Now, that's, that, that's a crime because he could have made it to the top. Hmm. And all you can do as a youngster is try. And, 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 and if you're going to fail, fail trying your best. You haven't failed because you, you, you went off the rails and you wasn't dedicated enough. Because everybody can be as fit as everybody else. You can't be as talented as everybody else. You can be as fit as everybody else. Yeah. And you have to get all your ducks in a row. And it just doesn't happen. It doesn't, you know, the, the best players in the world don't just become the best players in the world. They have to work very, very hard at it. And, and the and mental side of it as well, Steve. How, 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 do you, how do you become stronger mentally? Um, I think my background helped me. You know, I was brought up uh, not, not in a wealthy background at all. I was in the streets and... And I think I was grounded from day one. I always say to my, to my, or even to my boys growing up, it's about your people that you surround yourself with. So surround yourself with good people and you'll always be a good person. Yeah. Because they will keep you out of, of, of the mischief. They'll lead you in the right ways. Um, so it, it's something that I've passed on, is be around good people. Be around people who want to do well and won't get you into any mischief. Um, as such, you know, you're mischievous as a, as a kid and you've got to have that fine balance. Yeah. Um, but good people uh, help you in the, in the long term. So, listen, you watch, you watch a lot of Liverpool now. You watch a lot of uh, modern-day midfielders. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking to you because you were a quality midfield player. What, what sort of attributes do you think you need in the game now to, to be a top-quality player? Um, I was dedicated. Got to say, I mean, when, when it was bus strikes, I, I rode a bike of, of, to about 20 mile to, to Belfield Evidence Training Ground. I didn't make a, any uh, excuses. It was down to me and me only. Um, 
and nothing got in my way. So I was really dedicated to the cause and nothing was going to stop me. Only, only not being good enough. That's the only thing that was going to stop me is if yeah. someone's not good enough. Yeah. Everything else took care of itself. So as I keep saying, give it your best shot. Give it your best shot. Yeah. And I keep it even, even for youngsters, practice, practice, practice. It, it, it helps. It really does. And you, you've got to do all of them things. The, not, the, the things that you don't like to do, you've got to distance yourself from your, your school mates that you had when you're in school because it's a different profession now and you have to sacrifice you have to make sacrifices in order to get to a top and to a level in any walk of life you have to sacrifice certain things and be prepared to sacrifice what uh, what you need to do i, I tell the players that uh, you know every day a, a coach if he's doing his work he's he's testing you every day you know whether it be mentally physically tactically and and it's the ones that become a sponge and and take it all in and absorb everything and, and get on and do the work. So uh, they're the ones that are likely to, su to succeed. Do you agree? I agree, Mickey. And you know, being a coach, um, that you get a feel for a player more in training, I suppose, because you, you're day in, day out with them and you know their attitude, you know what they do. And you get big time players who can just perform, not many, just on a Saturday. I only know two players you could perform on a Saturday and, and just go through the motions during the week. And that was probably two of the best goal scorer and uh, centre forwards you'll come across. Ian Rush was yeah. one of them. Yeah. I'm not saying he didn't train, but he didn't train the way I trained and the way 95% of players used to train 100%. He could go through the motions at times, but come Saturday, he knew what we were going to get. Yeah. He knew he was going to get goals out of him. Gary Lineker was the same. Yeah. You know, he, he, when it was cold outside and he had a, a few niggles, he didn't want, didn't fancy it. But you knew on a Saturday you'd turn up. Now, them players are few and far between. The, the players that you want is, the, is every day you play, or you train the way you want to play on a Saturday. Liverpool um, taught me that, along with a, a, a lot of coaches. And you'll see that you cannot switch on and off. Do you think... Players nowadays that you're going into training to, to waste time, to fill time during the week before a game. It's not the case. You go into training as a coach, it's important that you spend them um, coaching hours trying to make them better for the Saturday game. And you do all your prep. I used to do my prep. And when players mess about in training and you think it's easy that you're there just for the sake of it, it does annoy me because it's... It, you know, you do a lot of work. I know you do behind the scenes, and uh, and you, you need that to be repaid in in, in your players and in in, in your um, in your coaching sessions. You want to see that back in. Because as I said before, I had to train my socks off every day, every day. And there's not many. You can't make it if you don't do it. So let's let, let, just quickly about your, your career. You, you won Liverpool won the title 85, 86, 87, 88, uh, 89, 90. What a golden era that was for you. You must Magnificent. have been invincible. Yeah. You know what? We, we could have done a bit. You talk about the invincibles. I'd rather win trophies than being unbeaten all season like Arsenal. You know, you might as well get beat once or twice a season, but win trophies. It, you know, is that because uh, Liverpool got beat at Watford this year, Steve? Probably. <laughs> yeah. Probably, mate. I, I would like to see this, this Liverpool team just win more trophies. They've won the, the, the Champions League, obviously, um, which was a start of a, a platform. The, the, the Premier League would have probably been this year, no, no doubt. But to be really successful and to keep about Jürgen Klopp, and he's done magnificently well, but you're only judged when you finish and you say, well, how many, how many trophies? Bob Paisley, you know, Joe Fagans, Kenny Dalglish's doubles and, and European Cups and FA Cups. You'd hope that, that Jürgen Klopp finishes with Liverpool, having said, well, I won two European Cups, I won three titles, I won the FA Cup with Liverpool. And then you go down as a, as a top, top manager. He is a top manager, but you've got to have trophies to, to, to go alongside that as well. To back it up, yeah. Um, and, and of course, your success in the FA Cup. And the, Listen, I know you probably get bored with this, but the 88 Cup final, Vinnie Jones, he said, or my mate Alan Cork, who played in the, in the game as well, 
Uh, I don't think he played particularly well. I, I can't remember him touching the ball, uh, Steve, but they said they were targeting Liverpool's best player that day, and that was you. Now, that, that's some compliment, yeah? It's some compliment, and, but I don't believe that it was that, it was that tackle. I mean, we had uh, a perfectly good goal disallowed. Peter Beasley scored a goal on the day. Uh, John Aldridge missed the first penalty in the FA Cup final. And Wimbledon were, 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 a, were a good side, a real good side. And the Don Howe is coaching methods and Bobby Gould, as you, as you know, um, set-piece specialist. And they scored from a set-piece. Sanchez scored the goal. So, you know, you can't underestimate that they were a good side and they, they got it right on the day. And, and fair play to them. And we could have won the, the double four, four times in the space of five years. Wow. We'd, um, we'd already won the league and I think we had the cup final and obviously that was going for the double and we didn't do it. Um, the Crystal Palace, get, we, we'd won the league and then we played Crystal Palace in the semi-finals of the FA Cup um, at Villa Park. Remember it well. Was it 4-3? 4-3, Mickey, yeah. 4-3, they beat us. We're leading 3-2. Yeah. Um, and that same season, a, a, a few months, a couple of months before that, We'd actually played Crystal Palace in the league game and we beat them 9-0. Wow. <laughs> we beat Palace 9-0. Wow. Eight different goal scorers on the day. And we drawn them in the semi-finals of the FA Cup. Now, what's the odds that they're going to beat yeah. us? It's, but yeah, you know football, you know the FA Cup. Um, they, they turned us over 4-3 and we'd won the league. So we've missed out on the double layer. We missed out on the double... Obviously, the, uh, the the Wimbledon game, and the biggest and saddest uh, probably day was we'd already won the FA Cup. We beat Everton in 1989 at Wembley, three two. So we'd won the FA Cup, and it was the Hillsborough season, the Hillsborough disaster. So we had a backlog of games, and we were top of the league. We, we were yeah. with Arsenal, and we had to play. It was very very unusual. Usually, the, the FA Cup is the last game of the season. We'd have to play the FA Cup and then two more league games to finish off because yeah. they were all delayed and postponed, obviously. And we had to play West Ham, I think, on a, on a Tuesday or Wednesday, and then we had to play Arsenal, the big one, on a Friday. So we had to cram it all in. Um, and it was just, for me, one, one step too far. Yeah. Was, we could afford to get beat 1 0. Yeah. Very sad that, that if we would have needed to win 1 0 or 2 0, I think we would have done so. Yeah, yeah. Because you subconsciously you, you, you're not going forward and you're not you're not taking risks because you can afford to get beat one 0 Why why would you go and open yourself up and yeah yeah? And, and we were a side that liked to go forward, so we couldn't do that type of game. But it suited Arsenal because it gave them the impetus. And once they got that one goal, yeah. I mean, we're all treading on eggshells. Yeah, momentum. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because one, one mistake and it's over, which, which turned out to be right in the 90th minute. Yeah. That they, they scored to make it 2-0 and, and they go on and win the league. And that was another year that we could have won the double. So we had years where we, where we were tremendous and we could have won a lot more trophies. Well, listen, that was a golden period for you. I remember uh, getting spanked on numerous occasions, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Listen, after you then joined Manchester City and uh, after that you became a, a manager, a player manager at Swindon. Yeah. Where you it had was, uh, a promotion, I believe. We won the league. It was, it was um, 24 years ago yesterday. Wow. It, it, it's a strange because Liverpool won the league 30 years ago and they look like winning the league this year. Swindon Town won the league 24 years ago, and they look like winning the league again this year. Yeah, and it could, yeah, it, it was like it's the only time in the career in, in the history that Swindon have won the, they've been promotion and, and relegated, but they haven't won the championship. Yeah, so that was 24 years ago yesterday. Wow, so it's a shame that, that if it does come to an end, that Swindon won't be promoted as champions because they're, they're, I think they're four points ahead. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, going back to it, management is. Uh, and coaching is always what I wanted to go into. I took my badges when I was playing for Manchester City. So I knew that was my progression and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I was fortunate enough to get the, the, the player manager's job at Swindon Town. It was very difficult. And again, it's not a good uh, 
good example to youngsters, but I tried to lead by example and I got sent off on my debut for Swindon Town as player manager. Um, yeah. Which is I not said, ideal. I actually as started off at Fulham as player manager. I found it very, very difficult. I mean, when I was making mistakes and players are looking at you and, you know, not, I'm, I'm worrying about everybody else rather than myself and getting myself ready. Uh, I was calling for the ball. They were giving it me instinctly, instinctively rather than whether it was the right mm. pass or not. Did you find that as well? The gaffers asking yeah. for the ball, give it me. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's very difficult to separate your management and player uh, role. And I'm, I managed to do it and, and get to grips with it after a month or two and realise that once I get out on the pitch, I'm a player. Yeah, I can't be both. It's, it's simple. You know, I've got to be as a player. And when I uh, uh, get off after the game, I'm then become a manager. Um, it was very difficult, very hard. But a lot of satisfaction when you win. It's all about winning. Yeah. Some people say, or ask me, what's the best and the most uh, valuable trophy? It's, it's that one. Really? And yeah, Well, because I was man player manager and, and you've got to look after a group. It's collective. It's not an individual thing. I didn't go home after training and go golfing and whatever they do after training. I had to sit there, then go scout and then get plans for the coaching sessions and then join in training. It was very, very difficult. So the satisfaction came with winning stuff. Yeah. And even at Blackpool, when I went there, we, we, were, we were successful. We got promotion there and, and then we LDV three times at, at the Millennium um, Stadium. And being a manager is is more satisfying the victories that you have as a manager because, as I say, you, you're looking after a number of people at the football club and, and it's collective, not individual. Talk, talking about Blackpool, I remember playing you on a few occasions there. I brought my Brighton side up, up there when there was a, a petrol shortage as well. I remember that night uh, well. Three-sided ground, so to achieve any sort of success there, you did really well. Yeah, I mean, and the purse strings were, well, I mean, obviously there was nothing to spend at all. We had to get loans and, and wheel and deal, as you, as you know, down at that, that, that level. A difficult place to play, to come and play, windy, yeah. uh, obviously, uh, right on the coast. Um, difficult times, but you have to make the most of it. You, you know, it's no good complaining. I knew what I was getting myself into. I knew the financial situation. It does annoy me when these managers have to, Eight months, twelve months. Say, well, I didn't. I was promised this, and I didn't realise that the, the, the situation the club were in financially. And yeah. you knew that. You've got to ask them questions before you take on any sort of job. Yeah. You've got to ask them questions, and and you should be. If you've got any problems, then say no to signs for that particular club. Don't don't wait till six months later and, and find out I've got loads of problems. Yeah, that, that's managing at a real level. You know, I mean, I, 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 get, I don't know about you. I get annoyed with Mourinho when he moans and groans about uh, things after after so many months. And, you know, I want I want I want him to show me what a good manager he is, you know, because we've worked at that level at the bottom end and where finances are tight and you've got to work with a small group. There is no money for transfers. Um, you know, I, I wanted him to show me how, how good he was when times were hard at Chelsea and, at Manchester United, yeah. but sadly, he, he never he never does that. Yeah, you know, what would it be, wouldn't it be fascinating to do a, a, a documentary and, and a real life trading places? Get get someone, the manager from Blackpool, yeah. to trade places with, with, with Mourinho or, 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 or Solskjaer for a month in the, in the off-season. Let him have all the facilities. Let, let me have all the facilities that United have got. Let me have all the great players that they've got. And let's all score a deal with Blackpool on a windy day. See if he can keep the bibs on the pitch, never mind anything else in the balls. Yeah. Let him deal with the problems that, that Blackpool had and, and Swindon Town. And then you can have the life of luxury dealing with the, 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 the top jolly players at, at, uh, at Man United and Chelsea and Liverpool and the training facilities. And you're getting looked after and you're getting physios and and you're getting masseurs. Yeah, you'd never be out of a masseur room, would you? It'd be four <laughs> masseurs a day. It's like ridiculous what 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 they have to what what they get and the treatment they get. So no excuses for the top top players. There is for us when we were managing. Yeah. But, but that's why I'm saying it'd be great if they did a, did something a bit like trading places, just just exchange for a month or a week. I agree with you, mate. Um, 
Listen, I'm not going to keep you much longer, uh, Steve. I know you, uh, from, from your football management uh, days, you then went into uh, punditry. Was that a natural progression? I guess so, yeah. Listen, um, you're, you're, a t you're a top player. Everybody wants to know what you've got to say. You know what? It, it, it was probably I worked for when I when I left Blackpool. I worked for Sky for for quite a bit on 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 Jeff Stelling's um, um, Soccer Saturday. And believe it or not, the panel when I first joined Sky was George Best, yeah, uh, Rodney Marsh, oh. Frank McClintock, and Alan Mullery. And wow. you'll you'll know Mullery, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and myself. So talk about thrown in at the deep end with, with superstars at the time. They were, you won't get any better than, than George Best. And everybody complained, or not complained, it was, it was a bit at the time, why George Best? He can't speak properly. He's not good. He? And <laughs> the producer says, because he's George Best. George Best, yeah. He was simple as that. He doesn't have to talk. Just sit there, George, on the panel. And when he did speak, everybody would listen to him, obviously. Yeah. But he was George Best, yeah. and, and people ask why. Quality. It's simple. Quality. And, and I, I stumbled on it, to be honest with Mickey, because I went then uh, to Australia, uh, Western Australia, Perth Glory. I got asked to be the, the new uh, coach in the new A-League. It's just started up, mm. and they were looking for, for names to go over and promote it and be the coach. And so uh, I took my family over to, over to Australia. A wonderful experience. It was too early. Australia was too early for me, and I was, uh, and, I was and Australia was too early uh, for a Steve McMahon, I think. Um, it was a bit of both. But the infrastructure and the frustration of uh, infrastructure, yeah. yes, uh, and the way I, I dealt w and, and coming from the Premier League, coming from England, and the discipline levels that that we were used to. Mm. I was very disappointed in in uh, the Australian. Mentality, because I always, I always believed that sports people in Australia had a great mental attitude, and I was disappointed in the football side of it. Yeah, yeah. That it was just a come day go day type thing, and he didn't take it seriously as I wanted to. Um, that was only my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah. So it was 12 months, and on the way back, the stop-off point was Singapore. So you stop, you have a breather, and then you jump on a flight back to the UK. And when I jumped on a flight and got landed in Singapore, I got a call from a friend of mine, a producer, saying, would you like to go on a show for a few days um, before you go back to the UK? And, you know, it'll break it up for you. And I said, OK, no problem. So I did two weekends. So I left Australia. I still got all my bags packed. I'm in Singapore. I've done two weekends for um, ESPN, the Premier League channel. And I get to call halfway through from the, from the bosses and. And he said he'd like to speak to me. Okay, so we have lunch together, and he, and he, he made me this proposal. He said we want you to be our first full-time pundit um, for the Premier League. Uh, I said, wow. I said I haven't even got back to the UK yet. I said I've just left uh, Australia. He said, listen, the contract's on the table. You go back. We'll give you a, a few weeks. You decide. Up to you, obviously. Go back, settle back down, and then give me your thoughts. So. We get back, and it was a wow fact. It was like, wow, Singapore, one of them. Um, I goes back, and after a week or so, you're sitting and looking at me and my missus, looking at each other, going, shall we? You know, you, you give you a look and say, what are we doing sitting here? You know what I mean? Um, and it was a case of, yeah, come on. So I made the phone call. I rang, uh, uh, rang, rang the guy, and I said, listen, deal done. Just um, cross the T's, dot the I's, and, and we sorted the contract out for me. And that was 15 years ago. Wow. So an 18-month contract turned to another contract and another contract. Really? So I was in Singapore for 10 years doing the punditry, along with academies. I had a couple of academies, one in Singapore and one in India, in Delhi. Yeah. So I used to fly over to Delhi for five days every month, uh, which was fascinating, to say the least. Yeah. Um, and then 10, 10 years there, and then Singapore didn't get the rights. It was too expensive for the Premier League. So I moved to Malaysia for Astro Sports. So I, I was on Astro Sports for three years and I moved to Malaysia to family. So, and I, I was there for, so, as I say, three years. So, and time was 
was up and I knew that I needed to get back and family reasons and stuff. But all in all, it was a very uh, eventful 15 years of my life. Wow. Right. There's worse places to be. I have to say I've, uh, I've stopped over in Singapore many times. Magnificent, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, listen, Steve, uh, I'm not going to take much more time. Uh, what are you doing with yourself now? Um, difficult times, as you know, yeah. um, and, and lockdown and, and, and looking after myself and my health. And I've had a, a bit of a, a health issue. Uh, I won't go into it. Um, but I'll be glad when I can get out, get on the golf course, get a bit of fresh air and exercise. Um, and we can move on and well, get back to normal as, as such. But I'm, I've been working uh, for, for Liverpool, doing a lot of stuff on match days. Good. Meeting, and Liverpool have been brilliant. So I go to the games and you, you meet and greet people. You get looked after. I mean, the hospitality is amazing. Yeah. Uh, and they actually pay it as well. Oh, happy days. They pay you to watch, watch the game and go and enjoy yourself. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's, it's not bad. That was and yeah, and then I'm looking, I've been just doing, and especially now, it would have been sort of mad busy. My diary was, was full, yeah. especially being the last captain to lift that trophy 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So I was doing road stuff and Q&As and dinners and stuff, all lined up, which sadly, no more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's a shame. Well, listen, I hope it gets resolved sooner rather than later. But as a, as a friend of Brookhouse uh, College, Steve, we want to thank you for your time. Uh, we've got lots of footballers here at the academy, as you know, who, who want to be footballers. Have you just got one bit of advice that you can give them, just, just to finish off? Um, well, listen, listen to this video first and foremost, and then you pick up, pick up what, you, what you want out of it. And it's not an easy, it's not an easy uh, journey to go on, but, but worth it. Uh, but well worth it in the end if you stick with it. I think Brookhouse College is an amazing facility. I've had the pleasure of, of and you know, I've worked with yourself down there uh, and Giles and, and, and all, all, the, all the graduates there. It's an amazing place, great facilities. Education is important, which is what you're doing as well. Um, brilliant on you and, and you've got a lot of talent there as well. And a, a young lad who's still with you um, from Malaysia, uh, Adam, is it? Adam, yeah, yeah. I believe he's doing very well. Really, he's a really bright well. boy. Yeah. He's a bright boy. It was an initiative we had by bringing two youngsters over from Malaysia to Brookhouse College. And thank you for, for, for taking them in and looking after them and, and doing what you did. Um, but Adam's doing really well, I believe. And, and I just say, and I'll reiterate, what, what, and I'll go over it without the risk of boring everybody. But don't let yourself down. Don't commit a crime. Give it your best shot and always have no regrets. Don't look back and say, what if? Don't have any ifs in your life, if it had done that. And, and because of that, and, and I blame somebody else. Don't have that on your conscience. Give it your best shot and have no regrets. And that's all I would say. And if you're going to be good enough and you've got talent, you'll make it. But don't have regrets. That's all I would say to you. Yeah. Well, uh, once again, Steve, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Nice to see you looking so uh, fit and healthy. Give my best to your John. I'm shaved. I I'm trying to grow a goatee. Yeah, well. First time ever. <laughs> First time ever, Mickey. I'm, I'm growing a beard. Look, you've got more on your on your chin than you have on your head, though, Steve. Unfortunately, mate. I wish I could turn it around either way. <laughs> Thanks, pal. Appreciate it. Cheers, good. Steve. And good luck. Good luck to all of you there. Well done, everyone. Cheers, mate. Bye bye.